Good evening. Um, thank you everyone for uh, joining us for tonight's fireside chat. We're honored to have with us um, Dr. Eric Fretz from the uh, University of Michigan. He's a, a retired SWO serving over two and a half decades with the dual PhDs in psychology and education. Uh, principal lecturer at the University of Michigan in the psychology department, School of Education, the College of Engineering. And I've had the great pleasure of interacting with him in the past when I was with uh, Naval ROTC in uniform. And then most recently uh, in uh, Nashville, Tennessee at the Student Veterans of America. Um, he was so gracious uh, after I listened to his lecture to um, present again this evening. So I know he's got, uh, he talks fast, he's got a lot to say. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, you, Dr. Press. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Biscuit. Well, yes, uh, pleasure to be here. I think I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen. I am I am indeed a recovering SWO. Uh, that is a, yeah, a lifetime uh, experience. Uh, I think everybody can see the slide with uh, my little photo there. Is that uh, working for everyone? Outstanding. All right. Well, let's go forward. So we're, what we're going to be talking about today is something called emotional intelligence. And I'm going to try and frame this in a way that resonates with military service. And um, I'm very interested in having you jump in with questions or stories a couple of times. I'll actually ask you if you have any, um, because I think this is really useful. Really, really good leaders in and out of the military show high emotional intelligence. And it is a phrase that gets thrown around a lot. There's a ton of research. It's really been a, a topic of increasing popularity over the years. We're up to about three or 4,000 research articles about EQ. And the nice part is that they're very consistent. The research isn't ambiguous. The research says every time you look at just about anything, the leaders who are doing it best are, are showing higher emotional intelligence. And I think when we think about some of the best and worst leaders we've experienced or and or tried to be in the military, I think this is going to resonate with you. So when we think about EQ, there are similar phrases, right? Like, oh, that person has good soft skills or that person lacks soft skills, or that person has charisma, or they lack charisma, um, or they're a people person, or they're not a people person, or they have high emotional intelligence, which you think would be abbreviated EI, but most people abbreviate EQ, because, you know, that's just how we go. Um, there's also, in terms of the veteran terms, you know, we do get this, you know, he's just a disgruntled veteran, I meaning he's a grumpy, grumpy former military person, or a problem veteran, and I, I do a lot of talking with veterans who are trying to manage their transition um, from active duty into, like, the campus space and whatnot. So when you think of these terms and some lacking soft skills or having soft skills, can you think back, does anybody have like a, uh, like a favorite, like, oh, you know, there's this guy that used to work for me that just had excellent people skills or tons of charisma or, you know, can, can you, anybody got like a, a story or anything they can remember where they think that this was really applicable? Yeah, doc, I'll, I'll tell you my, my Thank first you. Uh, my first feeling of a, a leader who really had it all together and had those kind of skills was the first time I met Admiral Ben Hacker way back in the day. And I met him for about 10 minutes in the lobby of a BOQ in Rota, Spain. And the next time I saw him was maybe a year ago. He still remembered my name. That was impressive. Yeah. Uh, and it, I never forgot how important that is when you, when you meet the uh, uh, subordinates and can remember when you meet them and little things about them. Yeah, that's excellent. I mean, that's a, that's a definitely, it's a skill, obviously, not everybody has, but that's certainly useful. And then, of course, applying it well. Reminds me of, um, one of the, I think the best captain I served in, I served under on the USS Chosin um, was a captain, later Admiral Daniel Bowler. And he really impressed me. He took over um, from a CEO that was a little bit less skilled and the ship was pretty tense and this ceo had a real gift for sort of letting that spring unwind slowly without like destroying the crew's morale and i was impressed with him because he just he came in and basically met with five to eight crew members every day for a couple of weeks just to get the temperature of the ship all the way from the e2s all the way up to the o4s and um and then what he would do is he would have a little it was a, such a simple thing he had a little file card box and he had the yeoman put everybody's name and significant others and the person's birthday. So when he was a captain on Chosin, 
you could be like the newest, lowliest E3 deck plate fireman down in main engine room two, scrubbing the bilge. And at 1100 in the morning, you know, before lunch, you hear this voice, hey, you know, Fireman Johnson. And you look up and it's your captain. Right? He's sticking his head down, looking at you in the bilge. And he says, I just wanted to wish you happy birthday. <laughs> right? And that is the kind of thing that makes such an impression. And I watched that crew really become incredibly loyal to this captain. So I was gift. I think we all are hopefully having seen at least one you know, captain or leader who has this really strong EQ. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about sort of where else we see it. And the transitions, right? Because for me, and you know, I, some of you I understand might, um, you know, be transitioning out or have already transitioned, or you know, in my case, you know, I was active, then I was reserve, and then I was reserve and you know, doing most of the military stuff, and I was reserve and and doing almost entirely civilian stuff, but then getting activated and mobilized back to active duty, and so there were big shifts and culture changes all the time there. And if you are good with emotional intelligence, you are going to make those transitions a little more smoothly. And there are. A number of people that I've worked with here in Michigan who didn't make the transition smoothly. I've I've had to, in my volunteer capacity, work with a number of retired E9s, uh, E9 Army guys, actually, mostly. And they just could not take off the sergeant major stripes. And they were stomping around in the civilian world, acting like they would when they had the E9 stripes on. And that t turns out not to do very well. And so this is what this is a this is a thing that just shows up over and over again. And I think when you transition out of the military in a process we sometimes call degreening, emotional intelligence is a big benefit. Um, so I have uh, two quick stories for myself, and then I'm interested if you have any stories. I'll give you the two quick ones that show to show how this works for me. When I was mobilized back to right at the end of my 20 years um, in 2000 uh, to 2024 years, I was. Uh, 2008, I was uh, mobilized to Iraq in the surge with no notice, and I ended up in an army unit. So suddenly I was working under an army colonel, uh, the 18th Airborne Corps, in Baghdad, Iraq, as a SWO, <laughs> which was a bit odd. And I had to brief a project, and I was the senior 04. Um, and so I uh, was briefing this project. And in the academic world, the short answer is what the ignorant person gives, right? In your academia, you unpack things you you spend an hour debating a single word you know and i was carrying some of that thinking so i spent like five minutes laying out all these details for this 06 and finally this little major next to me after she let it go for five minutes but she just eventually she just hauled off and she just smacked me in the chest and she goes get to the point and I, I looked at the colonel and the colonel was like, yeah, why did, why did you do that? And I said, oh, yes, sir, okay, this is the course of action, sir. This is what we expect the Iraqis to do. This is the plan if they do the other thing. And that's how we're going to do it. He's like, go, go do it. And I thought, oh, right, like I have violated the cultural norms, right? And I, and I wasn't sensitive enough to pick up on that. So I had to be hit in order to realize it. Um, and then similarly, when I was coming out of the out of the military, you know, a year after, actually, just as I was finishing my first round of like seven or eight years of active duty, I was finishing a second bachelor's degree and I was assigned to work for Bell & Howell, which is a company in um, Chicago. And I was sitting at a table and at Monday meeting, Wes, the manager, assigned Rick at the end of the table to make a 123 report, whatever that is, right? And he said, by Friday. And on Friday at the meeting, Wes said, Rick, where are we at on the 123 report? And Rick says, oh, I just didn't get to it. And of course, I'm coming from active duty. So I'm thinking that this is like some JG or lieutenant telling the XO that he just didn't do it over the five days. And so I literally, I physically, I pushed back in my chair because I was afraid of the wall of fire that was going to come down the table. And I looked and Wes just sort of looked at him and said, oh, uh, when do you think you could get to it? And, and I, I just, I thought, wow, I am really going to have to adopt some different ways of thinking about things, civilian versus military world. So I hope those stories gave you a little bit of a laugh in the, in the contrast between our, our, the two worlds of military and civilian. Does anybody have a, a quick story of like a time when like you just weren't, either you did or you did perceive the danger and the subtleties in the conversation, or you didn't, and it went a little haywire? Does anybody have a story for that, or we can just move on? Actually, uh, I have uh, something similar when uh, I was kind of dipped into uh, academia as the uh, PNS at Oregon State, and uh, my dean uh, called the meeting with all of her direct reports, so I reported to the office, and we all sat around the table, and um, there was no agenda. 
And so it was it was kind of strange because I thought to myself, well, you, you called the meeting and she was interested in how everybody was feeling and what they were thinking and what do they need her to do, mm -hmm. which I found strange at first, but then I saw the value in it much yeah. later. Okay. Yeah. So, and I think in this case, for example, you know, you didn't complain about it, right? You just rolled with it. You, you realized you were in a different environment and you just adopted that. You're like, okay, the norm is everybody just says how they're feeling. <laughs> right? So yeah. Awesome. Okay, great. So let's get into a little bit of the detail. So in terms of defining it, you know, we mentioned that it overlaps with a bunch of other terms, charisma and other things, but basically I prefer to define it as being aware of your own capabilities and emotional states and those of others, and then managing the differences between those to efficiently guide your thinking and the behavior that minimizes negative outcomes and maximizes mutually positive results. So admittedly, that sounds a little bit like a contractor speak, but let, you know, if you really look at it, it's basically, you know yourself, you can control yourself, and you have enough spare energy to pay attention to others, see how they're reacting and what they need, and you, everything you do is intentional related to how you've intuited what the other person is feeling. And that's really it in a nutshell when it comes to EQ is that you have really good control of yourself so that you're never a negative in anyone else's life. And you can pick up on the emotional states and concerns of others such that you can become very powerful because you're always able to give them what they need. So the really good leaders are going to show this, what we call sort of quadrant four behaviors. Um, any questions on the, on the definitions that seem to make sense? That's workable, right? It's the big thing is that you are always acting in a way that maximizes. It's always sort of win-win right? Because you're you're thinking about where the other person is at and taking that into account. Um, me personally, my background, again, you know, I'm, I've actually studied with Daniel Goleman. Daniel Goleman is the guy who actually sort of founded this whole field. So I've been personally trained by him, which is pretty cool. He's a very interesting guy, taking a couple certification courses with him. I've gone to academia quite a while. So I have six different degrees, two bachelors, two masters, and a dual PhD. Um, my wife and, and business partner has been with me for about 40 years, um, did three deployments across two different wars. So I was in the Gulf quite a bit. Um, and I've worked with the student veterans since 2009. I do about uh, 600 students a year through my classes, um, and my classes are all in top-ranked programs, uh, either between number one and number five nationally. Um, I got a couple other sort of paid jobs that are sort of part-time, a couple businesses. I do some active mentoring for about 15 people and a lot of other different uh, relationships and do a lot of board and charity work. And then I also like to say I'm, I'm a I'm an ordained minister, but I'm also a private investigator. So I can help you get married, but then I can also help you get divorced. So I offer end-to-end -end services as part of my thing. And I, I also am a part-time radio host and producer on Veterans Radio of America. So I like to teach. I do a lot of teaching. Um, and hopefully we'll have a good uh, we'll have a good time this evening and you'll find something of use out of all this. So um, we've met a little bit, so I, I got the background on many of you already. So I think we'll just go right into the details. So when we think about um, EQ, emotional intelligence, it's a popular term now. But I need to, you know, basically psychologists and other people have been pointing at what EQ is, even though they didn't name it until about 20 years ago, because everybody who studies intelligence, meaning IQ, they notice something important. People can be really smart and not be successful. And that's interesting because you oftentimes think, oh, well, you're smart and everything should be easy. But it turns out that intelligence and IQ is nowhere near enough that you need to have another thing, I think, called grit, which is hard work. And you need to have another thing called EQ, which means that you get along well with people and you can be efficient and effective. So, you know, old researchers like Thorndike and Wexler proposed that there had to be something like social intelligence that we weren't assessing with IQ and nobody really could figure out how to assess it. And we've had theorists like Maslow who basically would account for what they called emotional skills and competence as being a really part, important part of defining um of the human experience. And then we have Gardner. Some of you may have heard of Martin Gardner who did uh, multiple intelligences. And in the multiple intelligences theory, which are, is a little bit overdone and is probably not quite as valid as people seem to think, um, but he has an intra and interpersonal, which means knowing yourself and knowing others. So he was he was onto that as well. It's a really popular term. It caps it taps common sense, right? Because it's like, oh, I understand that he's a people person. It just seems right. There's a lot of books and a lot of money to be made in EQ. Um, there's an, and pretty much there's always a book somewhere in the Harvard Business Review or something talking about emotional intelligence. Now, is it a trainable skill? This is a, this is a very popular question around EQ. The answer is that EQ is trainable and improvable, but it's not easy. So just you know, spending this 45, 50 minutes with me is going to open your eyes to the concept of EQ and let you think about some terms that might matter. 
but um, you're going to, it's going to be a lot of work to really improve your EQ. You have to get a lot of feedback and you have to really practice and you have to have a coach or a mentor to help you. And honestly, some people who have low emotional intelligence are that way because of what I call sort of hard coded genetic deficits, meaning that if you have been dealt the genes where you can't read emotions on other people's faces, basically being face blind, if you have the genetics to make you face blind, then you just are not going to be able to perceive emotions on other people's faces. And that aspect of human functioning is going to be blocked for you. And you're always going to miss the look on the person's face to tell you that the joke didn't land and they're offended. And then you might make a mistake. So that's a trainable skill, but not if you have these hard deficits, right? And it's easiest to see when it's not there. So I have a number of stories. I think we'll probably skip it for timing sense. But suffice to say that one time at a social event, I had someone with such low EQ that this individual was there at the social event for a total of seven minutes. And in seven minutes, he behaved so badly and with such low EQ that 90% of the people at the social left. And the only people that were left were people that were pinned against a wall because he didn't realize they wanted to leave. And some of them ended up crawling under the table to get away. That was extraordinary. I will never forget that. One person with bad EQ murdered an entire social event. And these were veterans who generally are pretty tolerant of nonsense. So it's easiest to see when it's not there. And I think we can all think of some low EQ people that we may have had to deal with where they just, where you said to yourself, why would someone behave that way knowing how it was making other people feel? And the answer is they didn't know how it was making other people feel because oftentimes with a person who's low EQ, they don't really make any allowances for how other people think, right? So that's an interesting point. Um, any questions before we go on? Is this making sense so far? Is the pace okay? Does this seem interesting? If anybody's unhappy, now's the time to talk. Okay, I get the get the thumbs up from Biscuit. Okay, so why should you care about EQ? Well, like I told you, there's a lot of research saying that it's important. Number one is, of course, why do people quit? They quit bosses, not jobs. I In every class, I always ask, and the research is the same. Who has quit? And why did you quit? Did you quit because of the boss or because of the nature of the job? And overwhelmingly, people say, I left because my boss made me miserable. And so you can see that there are you know, over 3,000 studies. They're, they're, um, they're correlated in lots of different areas. There's, there's obviously been books written. There is a consortium that studies emotional intelligence. But basically, you can just see over and over again that, you, you've, uh, you've, that employers value this EQ, however they define it, higher even than technical still, because they know that they can teach a technical skill faster than they can teach EQ. It leads to better social relations for youth and adult. It leads to positive health correlation. Basically, people who have high EQ live healthier lives and live longer. Um, and I'll show you that too. From a, we do a, there's a Harvard longitudinal study that shows that that EQ is the most important factor in staying alive past into your 80s. Um, and basically, those with higher EQ, every time we study it, we see that they're better to resolve conflicts, they stay calm and pressure, they build stronger teams, they have higher social status, they do better at negotiating, they have better entrepreneurial potential in terms of their success with entrepreneurial ventures. On and on and on. Similarly, on the flip side, you can show that a low EQ leader is often very toxic and very destructive to the organization, leading to quitting and turnover and high team mortality, things like that. So again, very important. More with YEQ. This is these are just a series of cartoons, but they issue they they get at the heart of the issue. If you look at this cartoon, he's getting at something important because this is literally all of our political discourse right now, right? Our side, the glorious leader, their side, wicked despot, our side, great religion, their side, primitive superstition, our side, noble populace, their side, backward savages, our side, heroic adventurers, their side, brutish invaders. And really, if I know you've probably seen the same thing as you've, you've traveled around the world, when you visit another culture or another country, if you really look, it's all the same. Everybody's just trying to make a good place for their kids. They want water to drink, food to eat, a little education, a chance for their kids to maybe move up a little bit, a little bit of physical safety, a little bit of rule of law. That's really all everybody's looking for. And so we get very invested in thinking of other people as bad, but that is a mistake. If you really have high emotional intelligence, you're very good at putting yourself in another person's shoes and seeing their perspective. And that turns out to matter. This is an example hey, of perspective. Eric, if I can, uh, if I can take you back uh, two slides, I, sure. I just want to challenge one of your concepts there. Yeah. Uh, in the top line, you said 71% of employers value um, higher EQ leaders than their technical skilled leaders. No, they, they, when they're asked, when employees are surveyed in the career builder survey, they asked, which is more important higher EQ or higher technical skill, 71% of the employers said, we'd rather have the higher 
emotional intelligence, higher EQ. Right, right. I, I don't, I don't question that. That's what they might say. However, comma, my experience at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was that the leaders were chosen based on their technical skills for positions like the branch chief and the the division directors, and 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 they had very poor leadership skills. Mm -hmm. So in, could, in certain, could indeed in be certain, the case. Yeah, in in, in certain te very technical occupations, the the technical skills are valued greater than they. I think that the opposite of what you said is that they think they can teach these individuals how to be better, more understanding leaders, but they can't give them the technical skills. They have to have those core residents, if, if that makes sense. I think it is in very specialized and highly technical, very dangerous areas like operating a nuclear reactor, that skill yeah. set has to be there. And you can only yeah. choose, I'll flip it around one more time though. So I agree with what you're saying, but if yeah. you put a larger pool, which we don't have of people, yeah. right? And you could have high EQ nuclear engineers and low EQ nuclear engineers. You would choose the high EQ nuclear engineer. Absolutely, so totally, totally. Agree. With that. Yeah, any any number of places that have really weird distortions and pressures, I could certainly see that. Yeah, but the, yeah, and this career, career builder was a you know basically a, a an industry wide like across the entire you know all employers. So, um, so this is an example of perspective. Now this is a little trick because obviously this is this is we couldn't exist in real life because this is a visual illusion. But here you've got one person saying four, one person saying three, and I love the Marcus Aurelius quote: "Everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact. Everything we see is perspective, not the truth." And I think it's important to realize that there are so many ways that our own senses kind of betray us and trip us up, and also it's so easy to only focus on what we see and not put ourselves in another person's perspective. So if the person on the left would go over to the person on the right, and the person on the right would go over to the person on the left, they would see the other person's vision was three or four versus what they saw. And that's just, this one again would be a, a thing, but in real life, it could look like this. This, in a sense, summarizes every Facebook argument you've ever heard of, because the actual object is what's represented in the center. The people on one side are looking at that shadow and they'll swear it's a square. The people looking from above will square it's a triangle. And the people looking from the left will square, will swear that it's a circle. And none of them are wrong, but none of them have the truth. And that can be problematic. And so I always like this picture because it really gets to this one of these key things, which is to be curious, not judgmental. So when you're looking at something that clearly in your world seems to be a square and someone is literally saying, no, 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 it has to be a triangle perhaps you should go to their position and see what it looks like. Or perhaps you could both walk forward until you can touch it. And then you can realize that you're looking at a three-dimensional object that has a very peculiar shape. There's all kinds of options. But what we tend to do is just start screaming at each other. No, you idiot. It's a triangle. How can you be so stupid? I can see it with my own eyes. It's a square. So this is a really instructive point in terms of the baseline of EQ, which is to realizing that other people have different perspectives, different ways of seeing the world than you do. Some of that can just be culture. Some of that can be upbringing. Some of that can be experience. Some of that can be genetics and perception. So it's really important. And if you're really going to be good in EQ to have the skill, um, I see somebody drawing on there. Is somebody trying to, do you want to raise your hand or? Okay. Um, okay. So this is the next piece, which is, this is the Harvard longitudinal study, which shows basically they've been doing this for about 80, 90 years now. And it's basically how do people change over time? How do their lives improve? And how do different factors affect their life? And really the question for this graph was when you make it to 60 or 65 years old, what factor accounts for you making it to 85? What gets you that extra 20 years? And this is the result. These are effect sizes, by the way. So a 0.6 effect size is pretty enormous. And you have two of them at the top that are over 0.6, which means they dominate the others by a long margin. And look at what they are. Social integration and close relationships, the ability to get along with others and the ability to form and maintain friendships for a long period of time. That more than anything else is what's going to keep you alive. So that's another reason why emotional intelligence is important. Um, so just very quickly, when you think about how people differ, there's a lot of ways that people differ and they can differ across testable dimensions, which is in the, in the document that I can share with uh, biscuit is, is basically, you know, there's tests for intelligence and EQ personality, uh, Myers-Briggs, Myers-Briggs isn't really very scientific, but it's interesting to look at. Um, there's a grit test. And then you could just look at culture, background and upbringing. You know, I, 
I live the life of a relatively uh, stable uh, person with a pretty solid financial background now, but I came from poverty adjacent, right? My father was a, a fatherless. My father was fatherless at the age of 12 in rural Pennsylvania and had no chance to succeed in life. And he was very, very lucky. And there was a wealthy African-American man. This is the 1950s. A wealthy African-American man in Philadelphia had endowed scholarships for fatherless boys. And it was that by that scholarship that my father was able to get to Gettysburg and start his career. Really impressive. And when he passed away, I took a bunch of the money that he left and we went back and established a, a, a scholarship in Gettysburg for uh, young men and women in Philadelphia, right? But it's just those, those small things. People oftentimes assume, you know, that I have had a very different upbringing than I have. Um, and so, you know, you just, you really need to get to know people, understand their background. Um, understanding others is the foundation, right? You really, you know, you got to know yourself, but then really to really use EQ, it's knowing who you're talking to and knowing how they're feeling and what they're doing, being really aware of their emotional and mental states. Um, so again, that line, that line again at the bottom, don't be judgmental, be curious. Um, any questions so far? Still working pretty good? Got, uh. Okay, so it's got a couple of a couple of cameras are off, but a couple of cameras are still on, and and nobody nobody with a camera on is asleep. So I'm going to keep going. All right. Um, so there's ways of accounting for different. Like you can get a group of people together, and you can see like, okay, let's try and get you guys to sort. So I, I'll have everybody in the room stand up, and we'll go into different corners, right? So basically, I'll say, you know, depending on what you want, introvert, extrovert, you know, separate this way. So if you're really an introvert and you, you get your energy from other, get your energy from being private and downtime here, and if you're an extrovert and you get your energy from socializing, come on this side of the room, spread out this way, and then I ask them like, how comfortable are you with ambiguity and and doing something without a full plan? Like how 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 much do you need organization and you. You can go, I need to be very organized or I'm okay with chaos over here. And so when you do that, you see people sort of split, right? You can say, give them these quadrants and say, which one do you want? And I did this in my class. And this was actually a Zoom class during, during, um, it was a Zoom class during COVID and it produced a very interesting result. I let, I let almost 300 undergraduate students have control of the screen and they could draw whatever they wanted. <laughs> that was a very risky move, but they they didn't draw anything naughty. So this is what they ended up doing. But the, the answer here is that of the hundreds of students, you can see that a whole bunch of them were extroverts that really wanted to have a complete plan. But there were some in the lower left who were introverts and they were totally okay winging it. And I like to do this either digitally here or I do it in person to get a group of people to sort of look at each other because they've all been sitting in chairs. They haven't really Done. And now all of a sudden they're moved and their position in the room means something. And so the person who is all the way in the upper right, who's an extrovert that really wants a lot of planning, and the person in the lower left who's an introvert and just wants to wing it, their approach to how long you're going to wait to finish the slides for the presentation on Friday is going to vary. Their approach to how late they want to do the meeting on Friday night is going to vary. And if you're not careful about it, they're going to start fighting with each other because they're going to irritate the hell out of each other because they're going to propose things that the other person really doesn't want to do. And if you understand this about each other, you can take this into account. So this is just one example of how people differ tremendously, right? There's different models for emotional intelligence that you can pick up in different areas. Early ones built like a pyramid. So you can see on the left that it starts at the bottom with self-awareness. And that is, a, that is the place it all starts, I believe. So you start with self-awareness. I like that. And then you move up to self-management, which is now that you know yourself, you can control yourself. Absolutely. I don't like the pyramid, though, because it makes it look like step three, social awareness, has to come after self-management. And I do not think that that's correct. And I don't think the research really supports that. I think that you can go from self-awareness to either of those next two levels. But then once you have those done, then you can get to the top level, which is relationship management. The circular one is by a researcher out of Israel named Baron, and I'm, I'm not a huge fan of it, but it's out there and you could certainly research it. And it's another way to think about emotional intelligence. It is a very, this is a very business focus for this other model. This is the key for me. This is my quad chart. This is how I represent emotional intelligence to my students. And it's the core of what you would study if you wanted to think about it and, and develop it. The quadrant that you see here, quadrant one, that's self-awareness. And in mine, I actually, because students ask a lot of questions about this, I break each quadrant into two sections, aspects that describe what's going on in that quadrant and actions, things that you can take to improve your skills in that quadrant. So the aspects of quadrant one are you get to know yourself, you have accurate self-assessment and you're open to feedback and you seek feedback. It's kind of interesting because in the military, we regularly get official feedback from our superior, right? But how often do we get feedback from anybody else? Not that often. As a teacher, 
I constantly get feedback from my subordinates. My students get to evaluate me and do every term. That's relatively unusual. Teachers are one of the few professions where you get a constant flow of feedback about the quality of your work from the people who are least powerful and most affected by it. So the argument here would be that 360 degree feedback, which is something the military has played around with, but still doesn't use effectively. 360 degree feedback is really how you figure out what your EQ is. You can think that you have high EQ. You can believe you have IQ. You can surmise you have high EQ, but you don't get to evaluate. You can evaluate your own EQ and you might be right. I've met all kinds of people. I've met people who have very high EQ. They know they have a high EQ and they value it. I've met people who have terrible EQ who think they have great EQ, but they don't care about EQ at all. So people can vary all over the place on these three things. And some of them are more dangerous or destructive than others. So once you get self-awareness, you do you do all the tests, you, you do the FRETS EQ rubric, you, you sort of get that feedback and you engage in that for a while. Um, then you can move down to self-management or you can move over to social awareness, right? And so you have a whole host of things here where you can, in self-management, you then start to say, okay, I've got now, I know about myself, I can put rules in place. If I know that I get in fights in Facebook really easily, I just have a rule that I don't get in any discussions on Facebook, right? Um, and then over on social awareness, things like perception shifting, you can become really aware that generally what other people do around you and even to you are not about you. And that's a hard thing for some people to accept. But if you can really learn to accept that, you will become a very calm and powerful person. Because most of the things that people do, even when they're directly attacking you, they're not about you, right? Hurt, we say in therapy, hurt people, hurt people. What that means is if you have problems with things, if you're, if you're really struggling with life, if you're really upset with X or Y or Z, you're going to lash out in other areas that, you know, so if I'm, if I've had a really bad day, like let's say, let's say biscuits in front of me in, in the, in the uh, checkout line, and I've just had a horrible day and he turns around and bumps my cart by accident and I start screaming at him. It's because I'm just losing it, right? Like my kids are, are you know, my, you know, my, my, my husband took my kids, you know, whatever, and I'm freaking out, you know, it's just like crazy, right? So, um, and so you think, okay, well, then this woman is nuts, right? Well, no, if she's having a terrible day, right, then that might be why. Um, so that's the social awareness part. And then, whoops, sorry, I touched the wrong thing with me. Um, and then you have uh, relationship management, which is quadrant four. And that's where you really have the power, where you basically now, you have total control of yourself. You're, you're in control. You're never being negative. You don't waste any energy managing yourself. And then you spend all your time focusing on others, which is quadrant three. And now that you have this knowledge of others, you can focus on quadrant four, which is basically managing them and doing things that, that will benefit them. So for example, you know, I had, um, when I was, a, actually I was probably a JG, I was Lieutenant JG. And I knew that I had one of my sailors in deck division who really wanted to be a rescue swimmer. And I just heard this like a year ago. And when we needed to send someone to rescue swimmer school, I just went right to that person and said, hey, do you want to go to rescue swimmer school? And he was really delighted that I had remembered that, right? And he knew that I had paid attention, that I cared about him, and that I was trying to give him an opportunity that I knew he would like. He also did a fantastic job and basically ended up, um, you know, having a long, successful career in the Navy and being a rescue swimmer. Um, so any questions on this four quadrant model? Does it sort of make sense? Is it is it sort of presenting a, a an overall structure that makes sense to you? Does anybody have any questions about how it works? I heard a chirp, but I don't think I don't I don't see any hands or anything. You're going to have to help me with. Um, oh, there is a chat. Let me let me jump in this. Oh, please push your questions in the chat. Okay, so I think there's nothing in the chat. Um, feel free to throw anything in there. All right. Again, quick check, biscuit. How are we looking? We got about ten minutes to go. Looks good. Um, like I said, I, I think this is the powerful slide. All right. Yeah, yeah. So this is a good one because this is really this is where I've summarized everything that I've learned and everything that I try to counsel people on when I'm trying to get them to move through this. And so there's all kinds of shorthand. Right. So if you've been if you've been mentored by me or if you've been in any of my classes, right, people will come up and they'll say, oh, that was a pretty quadrant one situation or that guy was really in quadrant one. I'm like, yep. Or I felt good today because I stayed in quadrant four through a really difficult situation. Like, yep. So it's good shorthand. Quadrant four is basically your highest and best functioning where you don't get disturbed about things. You remain calm and you spend most of your energy focusing on others or being curious about problems as opposed to being judgmental. 
Um, so let me go back to the slides. There we go. This is the three dimensional thing that I talked about, the five axis model, where you can see here that, you know, you can vary how much do you care about EQ is one axis. What is your actual EQ another? And then what is your self-evaluation of EQ? And remember that your self-evaluation can sometimes have very little to do with your actual EQ. You know, some of the worst people of EQ I've ever dealt with thought they were great. And this is a pretty common problem. I'll be honest, anecdotally, I see a lot of men who think they have better EQ than they actually do. And I see a lot of women who think they have worse EQ than they actually do. And that kind of parallels some recent research. I don't know if you've seen it. They recently asked a couple thousand men and women, do you think you could land a plane if the pilot passed away in flight, right? So you don't have any background. Maybe you've played Microsoft Flight Simulator, but really you're not a pilot at all. There's an in-flight emergency. Do you think you could land the plane if the pilot was incapacitated? 79% of the men thought that they could, which is of course bonkers. And But only about 7% of the women gave that answer. And so it is very clear that in, in general, men tend to vastly overestimate their awesomeness at whatever it is that they're asked that they can do it. Um, so just something to think about here, because there's different levels. When you're dealing with someone, you might be dealing with someone who has great EQ and knows it and, and values it. And that person can be very high functioning and wonderful to work with. But you might also be with somebody who has terrible EQ and doesn't know it and doesn't care. And that's going to be a whole different ball of wax to deal with someone like that. So... Um, and there's a couple of thoughts here. This is from Viktor Frankl and from Man's Search for Meaning. So when I talk about how to be in quadrant one or how to be in quadrant four versus one, some of my students and a lot of people don't really acknowledge that you always have a choice, that no matter what happens to you, no matter how outrageous or dangerous or stressful, you have a moment where you get to choose your response. You can choose how to respond. There is no incoming action to you that requires you. You know, I, I oftentimes think about how when I was a young man, I think I must have been absent the day they taught this in school, but I became aware when I was in high school that if you said to another student or as a grown man, if, if you came up in a bar and came up behind somebody and, and who you didn't know and just said to them, your mom, right, just mention their mom, it would immediately provoke an angry reaction. In some cases, an instant fist fight. And I just found that so bizarre that why it would be that a stranger with just a couple words could completely control your mental state and send you into a physical frenzy. And I just don't think that reflects any kind of strength at all. I think that reflects profound weakness, but that's just me. But in terms of the EQ world, that is what that is, right? Because if you're quadrant four, you would then turn to someone and say, oh, like, do you know my mom? Like, I mean, Barb lives out in Colorado, but I, I don't even think I've ever met you. So I don't think you know my mom. So what's going on, right? You know, how are you having a bad day, right? So that's the kind of thing you can do. Um, Ram Das also has this great quote about the forest. But of course, what he's really talking about is the people, the people that you encounter in life. And he says, when you go out into the woods and you look at the trees and you see all these different trees, and some of them are bent and some of them are straight and some of them are evergreens and some of them are whatever. And you look at the tree and you allow it. You see why it is the way it is. You sort of understand it didn't get enough light. And so it turned that way. You don't get emotional about it. You just allow it. You appreciate the tree. So, you know, you may have someone who is a particularly uptight about a, a certain thing. Maybe, you know, someone I, for example, culturally, I find this very interesting. Um, do we have any uh, nukes, any submarine nukes with us? Or you, I'm sure you're familiar with the community, right? The interesting point is that within the submarine nuclear community, within the nuclear community in general, they have a culture that says the right answer is the right answer and the rule is the rule. And if an E5 is sure they have the right answer and are following the rule and the O3 is not, the E5 is supposed to disobey the O3 and actually check the O3 back into place. And that is a, as a cultural difference that you really don't see in like the generic sort of surface warfare officer world, right? That that's the, that's in, in that, in the culture that I lived in rank made you right, even if you were really wrong and you just force it. So I, that led to some really interesting discussions and behaviors with some nuclear uh, Navy uh, veterans that I, that I've worked with. And I thought that was really fascinating. Um, and the thing is that you could either get really offended by the sort of insouciance or the or the or the or the, the 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 behavior of these nuclear folks, or if you know that that's the culture, you can allow it and you can understand that that is their background and that is why they might be behaving that way. Um, this is a couple of good ones here. This this is the whole question of how do you look at a rose bush? 
It seems like a simple thing, but it really is about perception. You can either say, wow, isn't it great that this pricker bush creates these beautiful flowers that we can pick and look at? And that's wonderful, right? Um, or you can say, dang, it really sucks that this flower bush has all these prickers that tear us tear up my hands. Those are two completely valid interpretations of a rose bush. But which which one would you pick if you were being sort of positive and wanted to have a good life? And so that's something to think about. And I love this guy's quote. When I really started to think about this quote about probably 10, 15 years ago, it really was a part of me really starting to embrace this concept of emotional intelligence. He says, if you are willing to look at another person's behavior towards you as a reflection of the state of their relationship with themselves rather than a statement about your value as a person, then you will over time cease to react at all. In other words, there's great mental as well as physical peace in getting really good control of your emotional intelligence and controlling your emotions because you become very powerful. You get to decide what you react to. You get to decide what you get upset about. And usually it's not very much. And those are the kind of people who are perceived as very powerful and, and good leaders and reliable and someone to turn to in a time of stress. So that's another great quote that I think can covers this. Um, this is the basic communications model. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this just because I think we've only got about five minutes left. But you know, you, you see this in every communications 101 class. And the bottom line here is communications at the core of emotional intelligence. You need to be a good communicator. You need to think about what do you bring to the table before you send your message? Because you might have biases. You might be using certain language. You might be upset. You might be angry. You might be using profanity. You might have chosen the wrong medium. You might be sending an email when it needs to be a phone call. You might be sending a text when it needs to be an in-person meeting. Um, and then you need to understand the filters on the other side. Because if the person who's receiving your message has an inability to hear you for some reason or has a cultural mismatch in terms of the words you're choosing or has already really angry about something else, they won't even hear you. I think we've all, I think all of us can recall an argument where the person we were talking to was so angry, they literally weren't hearing anything we were saying. Who, who's, who's had that experience? Where you in an argument and somebody's been so angry on the other side, you just, you realized, oh my gosh, nothing's getting through. That's the kind of filter and blockage that we're talking about here. And it just, you just need to think about every time you're communicating, even the non gest even the non nonverbal stuff, the gestures, you're communicating with other humans from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to bed. And the better you do it, the better your EQ is going to be. Um, this is a codex that I think is interesting to read. It's the Cognitive Bias Codex. It's an attempt by some psychologists and some clever graphics designers to list every way that our brains and our perception fail us in terms of perceiving the world accurately and remembering it accurately. There's four large sections. There's what do we do when we get brain has too much information? What do we do when we don't know what to remember? What do we do when we need to act fast? And what do we do when there's not enough meaning? And each one of those is an identifiable and tested cognitive bias. It's worth looking into them. I can't go into it in great detail here. This, this chart alone could be an entire graduate school class. But the message here is that we should be very careful about thinking that we're always thinking correctly or that our perception is correct or the only valid perception. We should be very, very careful because our brain is wired with all kinds of nonsense that's been very useful for 100,000 years. It's, we, as humans, we are excellent at seeing ambiguous information that may or may not be a circle and deciding it's a circle. Because why? Because it was helpful to be very, very good at saying, oh, on the savannas, you know, in, in, you know, in somewhere in Africa, when you're like, you know, looking at like, could that be an animal that's trying to kill me for very early humans, right? It's really good to be able to perceive that there's an actual animal there on limited information. So we became very, very good at filling in the blanks. But what happens now? We see a person who maybe does one thing we don't like, and we instantly jump to a conclusion about them. And that's a mistake. So anyway, these are this cognitive bias codec is, is on the slides, and it's worth taking a closer look at. Is EQ trainable and provable? Yes. It's not really workshopable, though, right? You have to identify, right? Some of it is you just get feedback. The biggest thing you can do is go get feedback and see what other people think. That 360 degree feedback is huge. People above you, people, peers, and subordinates. Get all three levels, 20, 30 people, and that will tell you. Because I've had situations where bosses love you, peer, bosses love you, subordinates love you, peers hate you. The reason in that case was the person was really, really good at hogging resources for their team to make sure their team always had everything they need, but they weren't paying attention to the overall success of the company because they were hindering the other teams because they were so good at what they were doing. So that's a problem, right? Sometimes it's your bosses love you, your peers love you, 
most of your subordinates love you, but some of your subordinates hate you. We had an executive whose female subordinates hated him. It was really strange data. We dug into it and the female said, this guy is a sexist ass who never sends the female engineers on the hard missions. So you look at the data and there was like 27 engineer offsites and they sent males every single time. He never sent a female to rural North Dakota in the winter. He never sent the female engineer to Alaska. And when he was confronted with this data, he very innocently and very sincerely said, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I just never wanted to take them away from their families. I mean, wow, right? Like, not a bad thought, right? Like, I mean, I understand where he's coming from. He was a little older than me, right? But that's just, that's not okay, right? And that was infuriating his female direct reports. And once it was, once he really saw it, he realized like, oh, oh, wow, that's not, I, oops, that's not good. And so, you know, and so he had a meeting with the females where he, they, they met once a quarter to talk things through big changes. Everybody's happier. Come back. It's great. Right. But these are the things that you can identify through feedback. Um, you can really get to control of yourself. You can get what's called emotional granularity. I'm going to talk about emotions real quick before we wrap up, because the key of all of this is to know your own emotions with great subtlety and detect others' emotions with great subtlety. And as a matter of fact, there's some recent research in EQ that really makes it so that being able to work well to name and perceive and control emotions really is the core of all emotional intelligence. Um, the rubric is a locally developed tool that basically uh, helps you see what others think of you. And so you get, you get some personal questions, like it'll ask you, what is your life telling you? So how successful are the groups? If, if groups that you are on are generally always successful, that's a good sign. If many groups you are on fail to meet their objectives, that might not be a good sign. It might not be you, but it could be. Um, you know, how many new friends do you tend to make when you're on a group? Things like that. So you answer those questions. But the big ones are, um, how do you make other people feel? So these are think questions about how other people make you feel, but then it, you ask questions of other people. So that would be like this, you know, how much do you see them invest in energy in others? Would you want to be trapped in an elevator with them? If you were assigned to a group where they were in charge, how would you feel? Would you want to follow them? And so you get some really good information this way. This is what this looks like now. This is, this is an example. This is the worst feedback I've ever seen. This is a student of mine who I've worked with for years. This was his feedback. This is actual feedback, almost 10 people. A hundred percent of them said they didn't want to spend a minute with him in the elevator. A hundred percent of them said that they would feel disgusted if they had to be on a team that he was in charge. This is the strongest and worst answer I've ever seen for this concept, right? And so this is what the absence of EQ looks like, right? Um, and this was a real person, right? So, so basically when they asked the larger question, how do they make you feel? Almost everyone said, I dislike being around them, right? And this is really rough. And remember that this is a real person. This person has basically been with me for six years. He knows that he has low EQ. We try very hard to give him some tools to help him progress, and he's gotten slightly better. He also has some other mental health concerns that make the problem worse, but he's basically almost unable to address it. And there's a lot of complicating factors there. So a lot of times people laugh nervously because those results are so bad, right? <laughs> Not even an XO gets those kind of numbers. Um, but just consider when you, if, if, if consider what this guy's like, if, if someone is low EQ, right? A lot of times they make you angry. People, people get, oh, I hate this person there. He's always so socially awkward, whatever. But think about it. E having that kind of low EQ means that you're basically blind. Like imagine that you were blind to the color red. So you couldn't see red. You could see every other color, but everyone else sees red, but you don't see red. So you're walking with your friend. They're trusting you to walk with them. And you walk them right into a red fire hydrant and they, they bust their kneecap and they fall down screaming and they're all upset. And imagine now that, you know, they're mad at you because you walked them into a fire hydrant that they can see. You couldn't see it. You still don't see it. You know, they're on the ground screaming and upset, but you think they just fell. I mean, that's a, a little bit of a silly analogy, but that is really what it's like. When you have low EQ, you are constantly making social mistakes and you don't understand why. It's as if the world is extraordinarily cruel and everyone is playing a trick on you, which is why people who have low EQ are often very angry with others. And they always say, I'm, people always disappoint me. I hate people. I don't want to be around people. People make no sense to me. Laboring with low EQ is really difficult. Um, this is a couple of examples of a, of a relationship um, wheel by Dr. Gloria Wilcox. You know, in the inner ring, those are the emotions that you learn when you're in kindergarten and third and fourth grade. They're the grade school emotions. And then when you get to the middle ring, that's when you're in high school and you learn that, well, it's not always angry. Sometimes you just feel let down. Sometimes you feel distant. 
And sometimes you feel bitter. And those are different, right? And you need to name those emotions. In therapy, we say you got to name it to tame it, right? So you got to name those emotions because being critical or distant or a little frustrated is not the same as being bitter or furious, right? And if all you know is angry, everything you code from even more subtle situations becomes angry. Think of a little child who's frustrated because they don't get a candy bar. What do they do? They start screaming and yelling and going into a fury because they do not have the emotional vocabulary to deal with what is essentially just frustration. And they don't know what's appropriate in response to frustration. And then the outer ring is where you really get into some detail. And you can say, well, you know, because betrayed, how different is betrayed from furious? And how different is furious from skeptical or numb? All in the same range. But until you can name, describe, and work with all those emotions, you may not be able to perceive them well in others or manage them well in yourself. And this is just a funny chart. I think it's great. This was somebody, they made a periodic chart of human emotions. I think this is so creative and so clever. So I just like to look at it because I just think it, the artwork here is great in the sense of how they did the different series and they have like a depression series and a passion series and they all have different weights. I think it's very clever, but it's a nice way of illustrating how many emotions there are and the benefits of being able to name them and work with them productively, right? And so when we sort of go back to the, the, the stories initially, right? You know, when I talk about um, the my, my situation where I didn't have um, a good awareness transitioning back to active duty, eventually I got that figured out and I was able to work really well with this army colonel and ended up being, uh, you know, basically having a very productive professional relationship with him. Um, uh, and then similarly, I was able to adapt to the civilian world and realize that if I'm going to lead civilians, I'm most of my military skill set in terms of coercive leadership or just aggressive, assertive leadership was going to have to be toned down and I was going to have to do it a different way. So I think some of you might, I, I know that some of you are like still on active duty and some of you are, I think, long retired. I mentioned a couple of you had different careers. I mean, you know, now that we're done, I, this is basically the, the, the core of the, um, the core of the stuff. That's just my final thing. We'll get to that at the end. I guess we can jump to it. So uh, these, these, uh, these QR codes actually don't work. They were only for the conference, but my information there is correct. If you want that, that would work, but don't bother scanning the QR codes. So basically who has questions or who wants to share a story? Because this was the argument, the argument I made basically was that emotional intelligence is something worth understanding and studying, and it's worth trying to improve. And the only way you can really understand whether you have good EQ is you got to go ask people. And one of the hardest things for military people is to actually do that because it's very vulnerable, right? Nobody, nobody wants to have all of the E3s and E6s talking about what they think of the O4 because that could be uncomfortable because you're giving a lot of orders and sometimes that stuff's not popular. But you can, you can take that into account, right? Like you can still get that feedback. And if you know, for example, if you're the executive officer, you know, you have to be the bad guy. The executive officer is the guy who kicks the, you know, kicks the door down. The executive officer is the guy who gets stuff done. So the executive officer is never going to be popular. But what you want to see when you get the data is that it's not that they're really mad, right? It's not that, you know, you, you can see when you get feedback, you can see what the patterns are. So even if you're the XO and people are generally not that praiseworthy towards you, that's fine. But if 90% of the people say that you're late for meetings and you suck because of that, that's a thing you need to work on, right? If 70% of the people say that you make casually bigoted comments about, I don't know, short people or some whatever else, you need to fix that, right? So feedback is always a source of growth. You just have to be willing to go get it. Um, so who's got questions about emotional intelligence, how this applies to transitions, um, anything you liked or didn't like, feedback on the quality of the presentation? I'm here for it all. What do you got? Eric, great, uh, great presentation. I just wish I'd met you about 15 years ago when I was introducing EQ to my agency okay. uh, through, through lectures that I gave to our leaders there. Uh, my, uh, I guess my comment is I think many folks probably agree that having high EQ is important for a leader, but it's not absolutely essential. Our presumptive Republican nominee, not to be political about it, uh, has terrible EQ and is a He's very great. man in his area and in his business. In order to maximize the, the use of the qualities of your EQ, your audience has to hold you to account for having that EQ. Would you agree? Um, yes. I mean, there is an overall benefit. Like if you look at someone who is 
for example, known to be very, very charismatic, for example, like um, Bill Clinton. So Bill Clinton had a very, very strong charisma. My sister actually was briefly, you know, with him, you know, in the same room talking to him. And she said, wow, like that. And some of it is just sort of a Southern charm, right? But it just radiated off him. She said, wow, it was really powerful. She said, you could really see why he was successful in politics because just him in the room and just the way he carried himself and the way he behaved, it was just, regardless of whether you agreed with his politics or not, you just found him kind of compelling. So yeah. I would agree that, you know, the bottom line is I think it's all about how you phrase these things, right? Basically, for the to be a political animal in the current political stage, right, it's about making the most of the perception within the media and basically how this all is sort of structured within social media and everything else. And so Trump is very good at crafting himself for presentation within that to gain power and position um so yeah the the like you know you wouldn't necessarily want him and as many people who vote for him wouldn't necessarily want him to be you know the, their boss at the auto shop or something but yeah. when it comes to sort of being a divisive political force that makes the other side angry the problem is we've we've devolved you know the, the if you look at the political surveys what's important to people is that the other side that, that we're so far down this rabbit hole and I'm not sure we can recover, but whether you're on the left or the right, what becomes important to you is judging and putting down the other side. And yeah. you want to select somebody who's really good at kicking the other side, not somebody who's good at lifting everyone, not somebody who's good at mending rifts, not somebody who's good at pulling the whole wagon forward. You just yeah. want somebody to punch the other person in the wagon that you've decided you don't like. And yeah. that's the tragedy of our current political situation. And I would agree that kind of behavior and wanting that kind of behavior is pretty low EQ. I still believe there's a lot of people in the middle, a lot of moderates who have better EQ, who haven't been captured by partisan bias and rage. Um, but boy, you're right. We really need them to stand up because it would be great. It would, it would be great if a whole bunch of people would stand up and say, hey, Joe Biden, you're too old and cognitively it's a little shaky. We got to get somebody younger in there. Let's get Tulsi or whatever else. It'd be great if on the Republican side, everybody stands up and say, listen, what, what are we doing with Trump here? This is this is insane, right? This, this guy, this, this is terrible. This stuff that, you know, it's like, yeah, he, he got some stuff done that we like policy wise, but this, the, the trade off is horrible. What about somebody else that could be younger? And right. I mean, it would be great to have that, but I don't hold out hope. Yeah, done. Or, uh, Biscuit, yeah. Yeah. So um, one of the reasons why I felt like this resonated with me is because of the journey as you transition. You know, part of it is you're coming from a culture that uh, you've, you've become very familiar with and yeah. leaving that behind, going to a new culture, which even though you're a civilian, right, or you've uh, kind of swum in that pool, you're really not out until you're out. And so just doing the work uh, to better understand in quadrant one, uh, I found that that was a, honestly, like a, a two plus year journey to figure out after, you know, I joke, right? Being institutionalized for three decades. Oh yeah, it's a lot of, it's a lot of cultural change. It's a lot to learn. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I appreciate um, you and, you know, joining us tonight. And also, you know, my takeaway is just being curious. You know, I, I think the, the point you made was uh, at a game and you had the angry gentleman in front, you had to protect your uh, uh, spouse's honor. And you, you simply said, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was it was just a it was a situation where my wife my wife had said something a little too loud about being disappointed with the people standing in front of us. And um and this person kind of got upset and wanted to fight about it. And I stood up and but we were right next to a, a a 50 foot drop over a small wall. So it was just not the place to start swinging. And uh and I just thought to myself, gosh, you know, I don't want to fight with this guy. I, he's angry, he's drunk. I'm not drunk. I, I have my marine friends with me. So I I know it's gonna, I might go down, but my marine friends are gonna take care of business. And so I just thought this is gonna be a disaster. And so he yelled and yelled and yelled at me. And I just looked at him and I said, you know what? You're right. And of course, he just didn't know what to do with it. And he yelled some more. And I I said again, yeah, you know, you're right, man. And uh and he, eventually by the third time, 
he just gave up and turned around and sat back down. And so I, that's just an example of, you know, I didn't let his, you know, he was yelling at me. He was being profane. He was being threatening. But I was looking at it and saying, you know, this is the situation, right? You know, my wife kind of started it by by saying something unkind about them, right? We don't want to fight, right? It's not going to end well for anyone. How do I basically sort of defuse this? And I sort of played my cards in a way that sort of led to the outcome that I wanted. I, it may not be the stereotypical manly defend your honor thing, but I don't know really I don't know this guy, right? And so my opinion is that quadrant four, if you can stay there, it yields a lot better result because you don't have bad outcomes from poor decisions, right? Because you're being really intentional and thoughtful about what you're doing. So yeah, it's key. And so this is a huge part of transition out of the military into civilian world. I know a number of you have made those transitions and I'm sure hopefully some of these things rang true for you, right? Because there is a lot, um, there's a lot going on uh, in terms of trying to be your best self when you change a, a cultural environment like that from the military to the civilian world. So um, any other thoughts or stories you want to share? Or So would you agree that if you're a contender out there looking for an agency, or a company to go work for in your transition process, do you believe that there's enough information on a company's website to see if the leadership of that company possesses the kind of EQ that you think you may uh, uh, fit well into? Yeah, I I would say probably not. It's That's a very hard thing to convey. I mean, I you would want a website that kind of sets the right tone, sends the right message that they could, they could sort of set the right entry conditions. But I think you, you really, you know, it's again, it's that same problem. If you really want to know what's going on with the culture of the company, you've got to ask people who work there. That's where sites like Glassdoor and some of these other places are pretty interesting because you'll get those, you'll get those little un, un uh, and a lot of times those reviews are tough. Like a, you can't take them all. You got to take some of them with a grain of salt. Um, yeah. You know, because you, if you look on Rate My Professor, right, you can find all kinds of things about me, right? The majority of the students will say, Dr. Fritz is great. He changed my life. Best class I ever had. But there are other people who are in the same class who say the meanest things. <laughs> I mean, it's just awful. And I just, I'm so puzzled. because I'm like, you guys sat right next to each other. And I did my very best work for four months. And, you know, 10 of you say I'm awesome. And the guy at the end of the row is like, no, hated him. He's a jackass. And I'm like, wait. <laughs> Wait, you're the same room with me. So you're never going to please everybody, right? But but at least you know you get that kind of you get that kind of feedback and you know you you can do what you want with it. I mean, over time I've learned that certain ways that I approach things could annoy certain students. And so I changed that, right? To be better at it. Um, you know, so there's that's why the feedback is so valuable, which is why doing that 360 degree feedback is key. Excellent. Excellent presentation. Thanks. I enjoyed it. You know, people always talk about where's the glass half empty or half full. My answer is it depends if you're drinking or pouring. Okay, that's also <laughs> true. Yeah. yeah. How thirsty you are. Yeah. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I actually saw a license plate yesterday when I was driving down the street. And the license plate said half full. And at first I didn't get it. And then I understood they were making <laughs> their outlook on things. They're half full kind yeah. of person. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Absolutely. So um, just for the group, we've got uh, the next uh, Fireside Chat is on the 13th of February with uh, Rob and Annie Andrews. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, we want to thank Dr. Fretz uh, for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, and like I said, uh, I'd like to learn more uh, working on it. Yeah. I still get angry sometimes, but I think the two the two takeaways would be if you want, I can send you the EQ rubric. It's something you could adapt and choose, which I would I would recommend sending all the questions. But if you just want to do a subset, you can and send them to a bunch of people who are, you know, supervised you, were peers with you, and were subordinates and get that feedback in some kind of anonymous collection, like in a Google form or something. I think it'd be very, very interesting. The students that do it in my class, they're required to do it. Um, find it to be very interesting. And then you could do your own reading and just starting, you know, Daniel Goleman just reissued his basic emotional intelligence book. So if you just get Daniel Goleman's emotional intelligence and read that as a sort of a starter, that is going to give you the the core of what it is I'm trying to convey. So there you go. Okay. He's got it. There it is. Yeah. That's the book. All right. So uh, I think we're at the end of our time and uh, unless anybody has anything else, we can, uh, Call it a night. Awesome. Been a pleasure meeting you all. It's uh, nice Thank to you. nice to get back in with the uh, brothers and sisters. I